Well, good morning, friends. It's Sunday morning, nine o'clock. Brother Mike on the radio. I hope you caught my local radio broadcast on my new radio station, 1100 AM. That was on at eight o'clock on Sunday mornings. I hope you, uh, if you live in the Phoenix area, I hope you were able to catch that. But now this is my podcast at nine o'clock. I'm on twice Sunday mornings, once on the radio and once on the uh, podcast at 8 and 9 a.m. Pacific time. Thank you for joining in. Um, This is Brother Mike. I'm the uh, counselor at the Arizona Deliverance Center in Phoenix for HardcoreChristianity.com. At that ministry, we do healing, inner healing, and deliverance on a routine basis. We have two live services every week. Thursdays and Friday nights at 7 o'clock. Brother Rick and the ministry team handle a Thursday night one. I usually speak on Friday nights. At both these services, we have preaching, teaching, healing, and deliverance ready to go. And on the Friday night service, I leave my mic on during the altar call so you can hear all the conversations, you can hear all the deliverances, and you can hear my successes and my failures. So when you're listening to me, you can say, hey, that doesn't sound too good. I don't want to do that. Or you can listen to me and say, hey, boy, that worked out well. Maybe I'll try that technique. So it's all a learning experience. Nobody ever knows everything. I certainly don't. But we're all growing uh, in grace and trying to develop the mind of Christ and follow the Holy Ghost and do what's right. Okay. Nobody ever does exactly perfectly what's right. That's not going to happen. The Lord Jesus did, that's for sure. But unfortunately, he's the only person that ever did that. Nobody else ever, you know, got to that level or can get to that level. You cannot get to the level of the Lord Jesus. He was, (laughs) to say the least, one of a kind, that's for sure. Thank you, Father. He was uh, the ultimate of everything. But uh, we're all striving to develop the mind of Christ, and we're all striving to uh, be like Jesus and act like him and think like him and everything else. So on the website, uh, hardcorechristianity.com, you'll see all of our services. We have women's seminars. We've got Zoom services on Tuesday and Wednesday nights. We've got children's deliverance services. We've got another one coming up for um, August. The first Saturday in August. Pre-teens, that is a fantastic service. And uh, send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com, if you want to uh, file a complaint, a suggestion. Uh, you need to talk to me for some reason. We have uh, counseling services available at the Deliverance Center. Uh, I have a staff of counselors. They're really good. And uh, if you live in the Phoenix area or you're going to be visiting here, give me a call on the ministry line, 602-636-5800. And I can schedule you for a private counseling deliverance session at the Arizona Deliverance Center. There's no charge if you are a born-again Christian. 602-636-5800 and Mike at Hardcore Christianity. Dot com. A withered life. Wow, have you ever seen a time in our history? It's a rhetorical question. Where you've seen more people with withered lives. It's never happened at this level before. There's over 8 billion people on the earth. There was only a fraction of that on the earth when Jesus was alive 2,000 years ago. And here in America, which is where I live, that's what I focus on the most. Uh, People are being withered out by everything here, alcohol, drugs, sex, wokeness, social media, everything. It's just all been released into Satan's hands by the churches. The churches are colossal failures to God. They have not fulfilled the Great Commission in Matthew 28, in Mark 16, in Luke 24. Those three chapters added up, make the Great Commission, and the churches said, 
There is no way in H-E-L-L we are going to do any of that. We're not going to do that at all. We're going to take pieces of it and do it. You know, we're going to preach salvation. Maybe we'll do a little healing with this denomination. We're not going to do any deliverance. Now deliverance is kind of a big thing now since that movie came out. Come out in Jesus' name. Biggest thing that ever hit the country in deliverance. But that's a flash in the pan thing. That's going to go up and then it's going to tank. But the Great Commission was abandoned by the churches. And as a result, Satan took over the place. But he doesn't have every place. And the Deliverance Center is one of the places he does not completely have. Check it out. Mark uh, chapter 3. My goodness. Again, Jesus entered the synagogue. Now, you remember in chapter 2, Jesus got in trouble. His disciples were eating grain out of a field on the Sabbath day. The Greek word is, Greek word is sabbaton. The Greeks had one main Sabbath, of course, that, that's mentioned in Genesis. And then that they had uh, a number of other midweek Sabbaths that had developed over the years. One of them was on Wednesday, a midweek Sabbath on Wednesday. That's the Sabbath that Jesus was crucified on. He was crucified on a midweek Sabbath, Sabbath and rose from the dead early, very, very early on Sunday morning. You, as you will recall that story, the greatest story ever told. But here Jesus is uh, entering the, the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he runs into somebody while he's teaching. He looks up and there's some guy standing there with a withered arm, a withered hand, excuse me. Kiro, Greek word, hand. Axareno, withered, shrinking, shrinking. This hand shrunk. This one was normal. This one shrunk, right? And they, and they watched him. Who watched him? Religious people will always watch you. If you decide to make sacrifices for God and you start serving him, religious people stare at you. They watch you. Why? For encouragement and blessing? Far, far from it. To nitpick and criticize you. Religious people are chronic nitpickers and criticizers. Satan controls 99% controls of the churches and he puts... Uh, infiltrators in the system. And those are people who can't minister in the spirit to save their lives, don't have agape, unconventional, uh, unconditional love of God, but they are very strict on the law and how to do things and procedures and forms and rituals. And they will nitpick you literally through the gates of hell. If you step out of line and Jesus stepped out of line. Now remember, in the previous chapter, chapter two, he had told told the uh, the, the story of the wineskins. Remember that story? That was a story designed to slowly but surely and gradually get the Jews to understand that the law of God was being replaced. The Old Testament law was being replaced by the new covenant. The new wine had to be put in new wineskins. The old wine won't work in the new wineskins. Jesus once said, the law and the prophets were until John the Baptist. Since then, the kingdom of God is preached and all men crash or press their way into it. They break into it. They crash through it is what that Greek word means. There it is. Jesus was weaning them off of the law, right? Like uh, a mother dog weans the puppy off the hind tit. You know, it's time to go eat solid food now. Get off the tits. Go eat regular food. In, a, in something similar, Jesus was weaning them off the law by breaking it, and he would break their sacred cow 
the number one thing the Jews would not give up, the Sabbath. And it says, verse 2, they watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath. Therapeuo is the Greek word for to heal. It means to, to uh, therapize, or we get our English word therapy from it, where you treat someone and make them well. Only in this case, it would be treating them with the Holy Ghost and supernatural divine healing. Therapeuo is the Greek word where we get our English word therapy. And they wanted to watch him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath day. Okay, they weren't watching this poor guy because his life was withered. Okay? The guy was wasted. He was wiped out. Okay, we have them come to our deliverance center all the time. And of course, we rush over to them to pray for them at the altar call because that's what Father wants us to do. But people have withered lives, usually through self-destruction, drugs, alcohol, porn, food. Ugh, it's awful, as you well know. Phoenix has a horrible homeless problem. They call it the zone. It's downtown. The city's in the process of cleaning it out, wiping, wiping it out and moving these people. But it is sickening beyond belief. And uh, we get people occasionally coming up to the deliverance center from the homeless campments. And you wouldn't believe the, the kind of demons these people have and the manifestations they have when they come out. It's really shocking. But anyway, I'm digressing. They were watching him because they had a religious fever, a Sabbath. And Jesus was gradually trying to wean them off. Hey, I gave the Sabbath. I'm the lawgiver. And now I'm changing the law I gave. I had the old covenant there. Now I'm replacing it. I'm replacing it with the new covenant. I'm replacing it with the new covenant. Thank God for that. And that's where you and I are today. Again, by God's grace. And he said to the man, which had the withered hand, stand forth. So he pulls this guy out of the crowd to make him a demonstration. A demonstration. Then he turns to his religious people that were criticizing him, and he asks them a question. Is it part of the law, is it within the law that you follow to do good things on the Sabbath day or to do evil things? Kekopoeo is the Greek word for evil there. It means to practice stuff that's bad. To be somebody who does bad things. The other one's the opposite. Somebody who does good things. Are you allowed to, to do deliverance, sozo, on the Sabbath day? Or, or are you supposed to kill on the Sabbath day? Apokteno is the Greek word, murder. Can you, can you believe he said that? Yeah, he said, is it lawful, lawful to be someone who does good things on the Sabbath day or someone that does bad things on the Sabbath day? Is it lawful to deliver people's lives or is it lawful to murder them? Wow, what a bold statement. Jesus had guts, a lot more than I've got. But they held their peace. And then it says here something even more fascinating, when he looked around on the people that were criticizing and they were staring at him with blood in their eyes. And it says he looked at them with anger, Greek word, or gay. And that's the regular Greek word for anger. And that means that being angry is not a sin. Paul said, be angry and sin not. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Anger can be positive. Anger can be negative. 
can't, anger can be holy. Anger can be sinful. In this case, anger is holy. But then notice what happens. Being grieved, sulapeo, Greek word means he became sad over what? The hardness of their hearts. Wow. Porosis is the Greek word for hardness there. And it's where we get our English word, you know, petrify. If something's petrified and you have a petrified rock or something, wood, that petrified wood might be hundreds of thousands or millions of years old. In fact, I have some petrified wood in my backyard. My mother used to collect rocks and quartz and things like that. She had a little rock collection when I was a kid. I happened to have some of them and I put them out in the back. So when I go out and do my devotionals, they kind of remind me of her and I thank God for her life. And their hearts had petrified. Now remember, when something's petrified, it takes a long time to do it. Okay. Someone who has hardness of heart, petrified heart, a heart of stone, that didn't come Tuesday. No, that wasn't last Tuesday. That, that's been building for a long period of time. It's been going on for a long period of time. And that's what made him so sad. All these people looked at this poor guy. He couldn't work. He was flat broke. You know, all, all the jobs back then were manual labor jobs, 99% of them. He couldn't work anymore. He had to live off handouts from his family and friends. He was clinically depressed because he wasn't a productive member of society. You can imagine, you know, some of the things that, that uh, hurt disabled people and uh, damaged them. Uh, I used to be for several years in the past a rehabilitation counselor, secular rehabilitation counselor, and worked with the, the, the disabled and the handicapped. So I understand kind of the sadness and the disenfranchisement they go through. And these people who didn't have a disability had no compassion for him at all, no pity, nothing. And they just had hard hearts. That's all they had. And so Jesus' anger went from orge to sulapeo. He went from anger to sadness in a moment's time. Notice that? So he said to the man, stretch forth your hand. He wanted to make a demonstration of him because he was making a broader point about the Sabbath and the law of Moses. The law of Moses was being replaced by the new covenant. New wine goes in new wineskins. The new birth and the Holy Spirit living within, which you could not have under the old covenant. Isn't that great? Yeah. But the hardness of people's heart, boy, that hurts the Holy Ghost. That really does. Paul uh, told us what happened when you have a hard heart. You quench the Spirit. You grieve the Holy Spirit. And here Jesus is grieved. Sula Lopeo. He's grieved, just like the Holy Ghost is grieved when somebody has a hard heart and they don't have any love or compassion. That really hurts him. You know, God can be hurt by your attitudes and your behavior. Did you know that? Yeah, I think you do. Yeah, he's got feelings and he can be hurt by you not having compassion or not having love for somebody. That kind of stings. Stings him. And here you see Jesus is stung. He's grieved. But then he clicks back and he goes back to the guy in need. The guy whose life was withered. The guy whose life was ruined. Last Friday night, you can hear on the audio, I was ministering to a guy who had dropped out of a drug rehabilitation program. 
and I was talking to him and explaining to him how he got infected with spirits in childhood and that he had to get them out. And sure enough, they they started coming out and it was a uh, pretty dramatic deliverance. That's on the tape if you're interested in watching it. But this guy uh, was an addict. He had a withered life, a withered life. And you know, the Holy Ghost specializes in people who have withered lives. That, that That's when he does his best work. He's fantastic. The Spirit of God is, as you well know, the difference maker. He tells this guy to stretch forth his hand. He wants everybody to see what compassion in action looks like. And he stretched it out, and we found out something interesting. It became whole like the other one. It was restored, it says. Bang. Literally right in front of him. Literally right in front of him. Happened right in front of him. What happened that? While everybody was rejoicing and happy? No. No, religious people don't really care about people. Religious people don't care about people. They care about maintaining order and controlling their systems. And so the Pharisees went forth, it says, verse 6, and took counsel together how they might destroy Jesus. Greek word apollomy. Apollomy means to ruin or crush, smash, destroy, wreck. They wanted to wipe himself out, wipe him out. And guess what happened? Jesus, knowing it wasn't his time yet, you know, he had previously told the disciples, listen, nobody's going to take my life from me. I'm laying my life down. I'm not having my life taken from me. I'm voluntarily laying it down. What a story that is, the greatest story of them all. So Jesus says, withdrew himself and ran to the sea. I can't say as they're blaming him. I would have got out of there fast too. And, uh, huge crowds following him. So he was safe when he was with the people that were needy and had withered lives. He was in danger when he was around religious people who claimed to know God, who loved to go through rituals, procedures, and follow religious laws and the Talmud. The Pharisees were Jesus' greatest enemy before he was murdered. The Sadducees became his greatest enemies after he rose from the dead. Why is that? Well, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection and the afterlife. The Sadducees did not. They were more like Gnostics. They did not believe in people going to hell or going to heaven or reincarnation or anything. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, and that was the main theme of the Preaching, obviously, the Sadducees went ballistic. They went ballistic. It's unbelievable. But you know what? This, when you're a religious person, you could, you're not eligible for the promises of God, are you? No, they just pass you by. Guess what? If you've got a withered life, that's the best thing in the world. Congratulations. You're in line. For a miracle from God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God in Christ are yes and in him. Amen. To the glory of God through us. See, the glory of God is spectacular in heaven. And everybody worships him all the time as they should. But that's not what's important to him. The most important thing is to have your life glorify him. He wants to pour the glory of God through you. He's already got it in heaven. That's not his focus. His focus is you. What kind of people get the glory of God flowing through them? Let's think about it. Mm, Pharisees, religious people? No, far from it. 
It's not going to happen. Withered lives, bingo. You just hit it. It couldn't couldn't be any better. <laughs> it couldn't be any better. Praise the Lord. God is calling you to move in the spirit. That's what he wants you to do. Second Peter chapter one, verse four. Write this one down. Whereby are given unto us exceedingly great. Megastas is a Greek word there for exceedingly great. It means mammoth. Whereby are given unto us mammoth and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. What is what is the divine nature? Theos. What is that? The nature of the Godhead. The nature of the Trinity. Theos, the Trinity. And we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The Greek word for world there is cosmos. It means human world. We, we escape the corruption of humanity that, that stuck to us through the lusts of our life. Epithemia is a Greek word for lust. It means inappropriate or negative or sinful passions. They come out of the soul. Passions. Lustful passions. You can see here clearly that the divine power of God is not for religious people or people who are intellectual, people who are arrogant, people who are proud. Those kind of people don't get the moving of the spirit. God likes to use humble people that don't amount to much to flow through them to manifest his exceeding great and precious promises. That's what God's looking for. That's what he wants to do with you. There's no question about it. You have a withered life. Good. Good for you. You're the perfect person to get called out of a crowd, to stand before God Almighty. Where did you see that happen? We just read it. Chapter 3. Jesus stood, stand forth. And the withered guy stood up. His, his feet were fine. His legs were fine. But he had the hand, probably polio or something. There it was. He couldn't work. It was an assist. You know, he was disabled. Embarrassing, poverty, low self-esteem, manhood problems, the usual. He had it all. But what he didn't have until that moment was grace and exceeding great and precious promises. And so Jesus was saying, look, we got a new covenant here that allows God's Holy Spirit to come directly to you on a personal basis. And we're transitioning out of the old covenant into the new covenant, which allows that grace to come directly to you from God without an intermediary. You don't need a bishop or a priest or a pastor or something. It's just you walking in to see the Lord, right? I mean, big, big time. And you walk in it and see him on your own. There you go. It's right there. Look, Hebrews chapter 4 explains you this morning, right? It, it explains you. You're in Hebrews chapter 4. He says, Paul says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. What's our profession? Well, the Greek word is homologia. It means confessions, our acknowledgments, our confession of Christ, our acknowledging of the word of God. 
For we don't have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet he lived without sin. So then let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I mean, it couldn't be said any better or more succinctly, could it? I mean, it's clear as a bell. You are a special person. You know why? Because you've got a withered life. You had a withered life. You had rotten parents. You had uncaring siblings. You were bullied in school. Right? You grow up, and you grew up kind of fat, kind of stupid, kind of ugly, kind of dumb. Maybe not in that order, but you got around to it. And you realize that, oh my gosh. The old law was replaced by the new one. And now I can stand forth and be called out by God individually, succinctly, alone. Stand forth in the synagogue. The guy stands forth. He's there. There he is with the hand. But the people who had stony hearts, oh, that hurt. That stoniness God got angry at, but it suddenly switches over to sadness and compassion. God is hurt when you have a stony heart toward yourself in particular. Why? Because God likes you and he wants to help you and he wants to bless you. And if you won't receive it, that hurts his feelings, he gets his feelings hurt. What are you supposed to do? Stand forth. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Now, if you've got a stony heart and you're a religious person and you're going by the letter of the law and so on, you know, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Jesus told those Galatians, look, man, don't go back into Judaism. Don't, don't do it. Stand fast in the liberty that Christ has set you free. And don't become entangled again with a yoke of bondage. He told the man with a withered hand to stand forth. He told the Galatians to stand out of it. Don't go back to the law. The old law was replaced. New wine goes in new wineskins. That's you. That's you, friend. You, you're a new wineskin. And the Holy Ghost is pouring new wine into you. And so God is calling you to and out of a stony heart. A stony heart. And uh, you say, well, how can all this stuff be true? Because the Holy Spirit actually manifests himself and miracles actually occur. So when you see the Holy Spirit moving, you know that Christianity is real. If you go to another religion, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, none of those gods can do anything. Allah can't do anything. Lord Shiva can't do anything because they, they're, not, they're not there. They're, they're false gods. But when you see the Holy Spirit moving and healing and delivering people like we do every Thursday and Friday night, for example, that proves that God is, is alive. It proves that the gospel is real. It proves that Christ is real and that he is a healer and a deliverer. So this story about the withered hand works to this day. It works to this day. Say, as my grandma once said, the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. Okay, you can talk about how good pudding is till the cows come home, but until you taste it, you're not going to know. And you can talk about religions and all these other gods. There's thousands of other gods. 
Paul explained to the Corinthians that all these gods were demons. That's what he said they were. They were all demons. Okay, they're not gods. But the Holy Ghost brings all the blessings of the living Christ to you with when you exercise your faith and you repent of a stony heart. And you can get healed, you can get delivered. I've personally seen with my own eyes hundreds of people healed right in front of me. I've seen thousands of people get delivered from demons right in front of my eyes. Okay. So I can't be talked out of the living Christ or Christianity because I saw it proven. See, the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. But if you've got a stony heart and you're a religious person and that's all you're focusing on, you get nothing. You get nothing, you end up with nothing, and you die with nothing. It's a trifecta. And you're it. But now God is calling you to come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The best ministers of the gospel who move in the spirit and the power of God, you know who they are? They're people that had withered lives. Mary Wordsworth Etter, Amy Simple McPherson, Catherine Kuhlman, A. A. Allen, Jack Coe. Come on. Now, once in a while, somebody comes along who doesn't have a withered life. Yeah. I mean, there are the John Lakes out there. God can use anybody and everybody. But trust me, the vast majority of the people, the majority of them, who minister in the spirit and in the power of God, those people came from withered lives. A withered life is fertile ground for the word of God to be spread like the parable of the sower, producing productive results, some 40, some 60, some 100. If you had a withered life, you're a very fortunate person. If you don't have a stony heart, oh man, you're you're on the verge of hitting the lottery. It's so, your future is so fantastic. And that's what God's calling you to do. He wants you to stand forth. He's calling you individually. One person that day in the synagogue, one, got healed. Can you imagine that? They had the greatest healer in the history of religion, in the history of the world, in the history of church, in the history of whatever, standing there, teaching in their synagogue. None of those people knew how fortunate they were to be in a spot that you and I, frankly, would give anything we have to, to be there that day to, to hear that. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you like to go back in a time machine and be sitting in a synagogue listening to Jesus teach? Are you kidding me? Wow, what a story. And by today's standard, it's a bust. Jesus was a bust because he only had one person healed, but he was in the midst of a sea of stones. Ugh. Have you ever been in a church where you're just sitting there looking at the people, they look like stones with clothes on? Don't answer that. The answer is obviously yes. Everybody has. But if you have a withered life, listen, you're a candidate for a massive outpouring of the spirit to move in the supernatural of God. You can, you can do that because the ground has been tilled. You've had your ground tilled and you're ready to receive. That's how it works. Stand forth, put your hand out, withered, and see it whole. And that's what God's calling you to do. He wants you to receive these greater promises, better promises. All these magnificent things he's got stored up for you, waiting for you. Because all the promises of God in Christ are yes and amen, period. That's the end of the story. And the glory of them are to be re revealed, it says, through us, is what it says in the Greek. Through us. 
through you. You're supposed to be, you know, like conduit with wires coming down through it. And boom, the electricity of the Holy Ghost makes it move. And the conduit is you. You're the new wineskin. And you got to start believing for that. You got to understand that. You got to change your identity. You got to start seeing yourself as who you are. And if you have a stony heart, hey, you might you might end up with nothing. Well, I don't care that much, Brother Mike. I was wounded and hurt and beaten and molested and everything. Yeah, I know you were. I know you were. But I've seen hundreds of those people that were in that condition healed. You got to come to God and you got to start repenting. Well, I don't feel it. Okay, do it by faith. Just pray it by faith. Okay? Yeah? Just do it by faith. Just repent by faith. Okay? Okay, you failed, you sinned, you screwed up. Okay, go nail that to the cross of Calvary. Because if you're still alive, mercy applies. If you're dead, too late for mercy. Don't even bother to pray for it. If somebody's dead, that's it. It's over. Boom, cut it, drop it. They're gone. But if you're if you're on this podcast and you're listening to me, bang, you're in line for a miracle from God. You're still alive. So grace covers you. Grace covers you. Your failures, your sin, the all-powerful blood of Jesus covers it. If you'll repent, God will come right to you. One quick story before I close. Back in the day before I got delivered from demons, I was doing mentoring and counseling in the Assemblies of God religion. I came out of the Assembly of God denomination. I was in it for years. And I started to work with a woman uh, that I met at the, a prayer meeting one night at the Assembly of God Church. It was a Monday night prayer meeting. And uh, she was the... 12 years older than me, something like that. I was 40 at the time, I think, 41. You know, she was about 10, 12 years older than me. We worked with her for uh, a long time. I didn't know anything about demons back then. I didn't know she had demons. I didn't know I had demons. I worked with her numerous times over a three-year period and was met with constant chronic failure. I could not get the woman to stop saying negative things. I couldn't get her to trust God. I couldn't get her to believe the word of God. She kept constantly had this mind default to chronic negativity. Well, about 19 years ago, she got mad at me at her house when I came over to pray for her. And so I just released her to God and let her go. I hadn't seen her in 19 years. I get a text on my phone from her. 19 years later, she still had my phone number. I call her back. I said, oh, I'm so happy to hear from you. How are you doing? And she said to me, Mike, I'm not doing well. Now I, now I can't see out of my right eye. I'm sicker than I ever was. And God just won't come to me. And I told her, well, I want you to see um, one of my counselors. I've got a, a lady who's really good with soul wounds on staff, and I'm going to have her come over to your house and, and uh, minister to you. So I go home that night. I went home that night that I got that text. I told my wife, because my wife, Karen, had been with me a couple of times when I went over to her house to minister to her. Um, this was like 21 years ago or something. And um, my wife, Karen, and I weren't married then. We were just dating. And uh, I says to her, you're not going to believe this. So-and-so called me on the phone. I talked to her today. You're not going to believe it. After 19 years, I heard from her again. And the first thing my wife says to me, this is a true story. My mouth hit the floor. The first thing my wife says to me is, quote, did she tell you that God won't come to her? Unquote. That's what my wife said. 
And that was exactly what this woman said to me after 19 years. Fast forward to the following week. One of my counselors goes over to her house. She's really good with, with a prayer and, and soul wounds, real good. And she spends four hours with her, four and a half hours with this lady. At the beginning of it, the lady says to her, God won't come to me. And so she gets up and goes to the bathroom. She comes back and the counselor starts praying for her and the Holy Spirit came right to her. He touched her spirit, man. It was beautiful. She started crying. And it was amazing. He touched her. And the counselor says, see, God loves you. He cares about you. He touched you. And she says to her in response, yeah, but it never stays. And that was it. She quenched the spirit. I told her the words that Jesus said when I talked to her on the phone the last time. I said, listen, by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. The Greek word for condemned there is krino, which means judged. And the devil judged her after she said that and now it's over it's over for all the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ unless you Reject them. And then they are worthless to you. Now that poor lady, she's born again, but unfortunately she'll be dying soon. And her life and chance for, for being healed is over because she chose not to believe. But you are not like her, you are like the man with the withered hand. Jesus said, stand forward in the crowd. And he did. And he told the guy, stretch forth your hand. And he couldn't stretch it forth, but he tried to. And as he tried to, it became whole as the other. Yeah. By your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be judged. And since you're on this podcast, you are of the sort of person who wants God's perfect will in their life. They want to be a conduit of the Holy Ghost, ministering to others in the supernatural. That's what you're after. And God is calling you individually because you've had a withered life. Those are the best kind of lives for him. People who are withered and broken tend to be more tender and have softer hearts than people who have stony hearts and who are filled with anger, bitterness, resentments, and vengeance. When your heart gets stone cold, you find yourself outside of all the blessings of God in Christ. They become no and no way. You see that? By the way, I read that story many years ago. Long before I got delivered from demons and long before I went into praying for the sick. And I kept rereading it after I got delivered from demons. And I realized that miracles don't just pop into your lap. They're triggered. By what? Action. Now, that withered hand guy couldn't, but he tried. He 
He did what he was told. The guy on the cot by the pool of Bethesda had been there for 36 years. Remember that? Jesus said, pick up your bed and walk. The guy let down through the skylight, torn up the roof. They did an improvisational skylight and dropped this guy down. Bang. And Jesus looked at him and said, your sins are forgiven. This is the new covenant, not the old one. This is the new covenant. Faith in me, I'll forgive you of your sins. I don't need to have a goats and bulls sacrificed. <laughs> and he told, told the kid, after he was emotionally healed first, to get up and walk. Well, he couldn't, but he tried to get up and walk. You see that? Once the person tries to obey, the Holy Ghost takes it the rest of the way. And I learned that from reading those stories. And that's how I do my altar activities. You can watch it every Friday night. I leave my mic on. You can literally visually and hear it, audibly, auditorily hear it it's right there. I tell them, okay, I just prayed for your knees. You know, okay, like stand up. If they don't stand up, I pull them up. Okay, start walking. And they take a little step. Then I give them a little shove. Not a big one. I don't get a Nerf back, bat and start doing the back of their head. No. I don't have any Nerf bats. They start walking. And then they're healed. It happened uh, two Fridays ago to a Native American woman. Both of her knees got her cartilage restored. I just gave her a little shove. But it's not... It's not that you can do what you were told to do. It's that you attempted to do it. Demonstrating your faith, stepping out in your faith, triggering your faith, triggering the miracle. Bang! It strikes. Well, I can't do this. I can't do that. Of course you can't. That's why you were asked to do it. Okay? You need to get out of this pity party mentality. Okay, You need to repent of it. You got to get rid of this crap. You've got to stand forth. Stretch out your hand. I can't stretch it out, but I'll try since you said so. Boom, healed. Pick up your cot. I can't pick it up because I'm paralyzed, but because you said so, I'll try. Boom, he's healed. Stand up and pick up your cot. Go on into the temple. I can't, but if you say so, I'll try. Boom, he was healed. You see that? Miracles don't just happen, they're triggered. Triggered by what? You stepping out on your faith. You have to do it. You can't sit there and wait for everything to fall in your lap. <laughs> well, I just gave you the, the key to a miracle there. You know, that's how it works. I know from personal experience, I know I've seen it, I know I've facilitated it, I know what I'm talking about. Try it. Yeah. What am I about? What am I really saying? Hey, if you've had a withered life, you're in the best spot you could possibly be. Having a withered life is one of the best things that can happen to you for ministry later in life. You're a very fortunate person if you had a withered life and your life sucked. If you were the king of the sucks, man, you're in line for one home run after the other. I'm telling you, you are going to be a conduit for the ministry of the Holy Ghost. Yes, stand forth. <laughs>